Um, I'm just going to say a quick word uh, uh, about us, just so you know who we are. Um, but I found that uh, how many of you are here as a result of Internet Week? Just quickly, raise your hands. Okay, good, good number of you. It's important to always tell people how to get on the Internet Week at Internet Week, because people always complain, it's Internet Week and I can't get on the Internet. Um, so these are the, the, the credentials that you need those. Um, New York City Media Lab is a consortium of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, Columbia, and NYU. And we also work with other schools, uh, Cornell Tech, CUNY, the New School, etc. Our goal is to drive collaboration between the institutions of higher education and the uh, digital media and technology industry in New York City. Uh, so I'm here tonight, also my colleague Julia. Um, we help connect, uh, help people make things, and help people discover. We do a lot of networking and events. You'll see a lot of uh, events on our website and our newsletter. Help people make things through brainstorming and uh, concepting. Help people discover by connecting with the research function on the campuses. Um, we have a, a variety of corporate members, uh, some of whom are represented here on the panel tonight, and we thank them very much for their support. Uh, we do a bunch of events on data science, on, uh, on uh, the future of electronics, on uh, mobile. Uh, we've got something coming up at, at, part, at General Assembly with Parsons on gaming on June 5th. You can find that on our site if you'd like to check that out. Our big one of the years on September 19th, our annual summit, so put that in your calendar. Uh, the big thing we do is we connect uh, PhD and master's students with, uh, with executives, technologists, and companies to do projects. A good example of that project we did with Hearst, uh, which built a new uh, visual uh, interface on top of all of their magazine content and, and API, which resulted in a little company called Velocity.io, which is launching right now. Um, you can check out more about that on our website. We're going to get started with uh, the value in the vault. Um, and uh, I had to put this up there. Does anybody know what this is? Red is a lot of star. Um, so I think this is what a lot of people think about when they think about the vault. Um, so, uh, you know, to me, uh, I have this in mind. Actually, I was told at one point by some folks at Hearst that there is actually something very similar to this that they have for a lot of their physical media uh, somewhere in the Bronx, actually. So perhaps uh, there's someone here from Hearst who might be able to tell us more about that. Um, but, uh, you know, we're excited about this conversation um, because it's one that our member companies sort of asked for. Uh, they said, you know, this is a topic that many of us are concerned with in the media these days. Uh, how do we take advantage of um, content that we, uh, we have uh, invested in in the past, uh, in some cases, some of the companies uh, certainly represented here today, decades and decades in the past, um, and what technologies are, are making that possible. Uh, so we have an excellent panel here tonight uh, to do that, um, and uh, I'll allow them to uh, uh, say each a, a bit about what they do in their, uh, uh, their, 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 their companies and, and programs on the, uh, at the universities, um, but if you want to find their bios, you can go to nycmedialab.org slash vault uh, and read all about them. Um, here are the various Twitter handles that we believe are associated with tonight, so should you find a, a need to tweet, you're welcome to do that. Indiana Jones is on there, just in case. Um, and uh, and we'll, we'll get started. We're going to do a round of short presentations uh, from each of the, uh, each of the panelists, um, and we're going to start with our host, we're going to start with Jim. Uh, and let him go first. Uh, so I'm going to help out a bit with the, uh, um, the PowerPoint and the rest of that. And so hopefully uh, this will all work uh, easy enough. We'll and I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Justin. So everyone, my name is Jim Chu. Uh, I was show stock for about three and a half years. And uh, it's, thank you for coming here uh, during Internet Week. It's great to have you all here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of flavor on uh, the issue or the, the arc, as Justin put it. Um, I remember talking to a lot of our customers, and uh, they all are struggling with uh, this content opportunity. There's lots and lots of uh, content available, but how do you create value with those item content is really one of the things that uh, a lot of people are looking at. And, uh, trying to figure out how to do that in a cost-efficient manner that actually creates a return on any investment is really a key driver. So for example, one of the, uh, one of the large uh, grading card company, uh, they have lots and lots of uh, illustrations that was artists on, uh, that's archived in the basement, as Justin put it. Uh, thousands of uh, thousands of them, they don't know what to do with it. Uh, it's just kind of sitting there. Uh, so one key driver, um, some folks are obviously thinking about, hey, maybe I can do something with it. Perhaps we can build some internet website and perhaps we can figure out how to license it. Perhaps we can figure out how to create some value out of it. But 
uh, quite a bit of work uh, in terms of upfront costs to get that accomplished and, uh, and so forth. So in light of that, uh, also just to talk about Showstock, you know, one of the things that John Larger, who was the founder of the company, built this sort of the ecosystem about uh, 11 years ago, uh, which is creating a way for uh, our customers to find great creative images, all 35 million of them, 1.7 million videos, uh, along with contributors, 55,000 of them, that uh, both individual freelancers to um, um, professional photographers all the way up to media agencies as well as uh, larger, larger organizations that are looking to figure out how to uh, exploit those content that they have and so forth. So this sort of the ecosystem has been growing over the course of uh, the years. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's gotten a little bit bigger uh, over the years. Uh, and, uh, and now we have uh, a million active customers that's uh, using our collection libraries across 150 uh, countries. So that represents to a lot of downloads that's taking place uh, in terms of photo images. We have uh, already downloaded uh, over 400 million uh, to date. And one of the key driver, again, uh, going back is really uh, creating a very efficient marketplace that's uh, very easy to use, very easy to find things, uh, and make it very, very intuitive, which is the, the hard part, uh, in, in terms of searching through the 35 million images and ever growing. Uh, but it is one of the key uh, technology that we spend a lot of time uh, to ensure things like the search, search experience, and the ranking algorithm that present the right set of images uh, to the most precious real estate, which is the first page. There's also a lot of challenges, obviously, and I think uh, in terms of how to do this in a way that is uh, very, very uh, easy to use in terms of finding the perfect image. Uh, we're also hearing from our customers that you know, they're looking for better ways to not just type in the text, but they want to look for ways to visually search for things, uh, including a uh, other discovery path other means of really finding that. So you know, we have incorporated a lot of those techniques into our search uh, environment, including this thing called Spectrum, which is a slider that enables you to figure out you know, what color uh, that you're searching for and be able to come back with uh, instantaneously a set of images that relates to that. We also are very optimistic in terms of some of the things that can contribute to exploring archive in the future. Uh, you know, things like um, uh, machine learning, things like uh, automatically generating a uh, set of metadata that describes the image uh, are all things that's really exciting. I believe that uh, as we continue to evolve down to this sort of the, uh, the newer age with lots and lots of uh, cheap uh, CPU cycles and GPUs and so forth, this will enable us to do a lot more uh, creative ways to help people find those images uh, in a much more quicker and seamless manner. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight is uh, the ecosystem also extends to uh, content distribution in terms of reach. So not only that we have a lot of customers that's using our, uh, our marketplace for the purpose of uh, finding that right image, but we're also extended out to, for example, Facebook. Uh, where the folks are using the ad platform to create the ads for, uh, for use on Facebook, the right-hand column, uh, there's now a uh, connection into our library and collection and be able to select the right images for that purpose. Or on the left-hand side, you have uh, the notion around uh, uh, Salesforce.com, Buddy Media, and the brand manager is able to uh, use that tool to be able to, uh, again, control the brand experience by adding images from the Shutterstock library collection as well. And uh, for the last piece, uh, obviously, you know, the traditional images connecting with something like the Cafe Press out of uh, Big Stock uh, uh, website is enabling uh, folks to be able to 
merchandise uh, and be able to unleash value. So all these various things we believe contribute to the fact that uh, there is a path to creating uh, value for those uh, arc, uh, in terms of the archives content and be able to uh, uh, leverage that in a very efficient manner. Thank you, Jim. Now, Mark, uh, I'll, I'll do the... Good evening, everyone. Hey, I'm uh, Mark Franz. I'm the CIO of the, of the New York Times company. It's quiet for the company. Not very much better atmosphere. <laughs> Anyway, it's not what I'm here to talk about this evening. Uh, so, uh, if you've been around in publishing since 1851, you have a lot of archival content. Uh, and it's something that we've always paid a lot of attention to, but it's, it's always been kind of an issue for us because we're so focused on the news of the day and, and being real time in this age of the internet that you know, it's easy to forget about the archive. But we haven't really forgotten about it. We have uh, you know, many things that we do. I'm going to just take you through a couple of them. So, um, because we're at Shutterstock's beautiful offices, I thought I'd sort of, you know, show uh, some of the ways we do photographs. So we, we started that a couple of years ago, experimenting, uh, actually with a Tumblr blog uh, called The Live of War, which takes out you know, some of the great uh, archival photos, some of our archives, <laughs> and, and then comments about them. So it's really terrific, uh, and, and you should check it out. And, and it, it, it then shows you, you know, the back of the photograph, which contains all this amazing metadata and, and, and uh, issues about it. Um, so that is that's one way. But it's really just something of uh, a small segment of millions of, of photographs on our board that we are eventually going to get around to, uh, to digitizing and to putting up online. Uh, but we had some other things we wanted to do first. Uh, we had, I've been at the Times eight years, I think probably 20 years before that, we've been talking about creating a product with all of our recipes. And we said, gee, you know, we really should create a recipe database. We have over 30,000 recipes in town. So later this year, we'll be releasing our first really beautiful website and app. It's kind of a cooking app. So our, our team has taken thousands of these recipes. We've been new photographs. We've tested them again because you know, a lot of things don't translate that were sort of cooked 40 years ago. Uh, and this is going to release really later this year, probably in the fall. Um, so that's a new thing. And uh, Justin, his uh, username and password is on his computer, so I'm sure that I know what he's doing this evening. <laughs> uh, the main thing that I wanted to show you tonight is something we call Times Machine, which uh, is our archive browser, but, uh, but a lot more than that. So if you think about the usual, the typical way uh, somebody searches the New York Times, so let's say you want to search for some relatively obscure historical figure. I'm going to search for a fellow named John Fairfax, who was one of those guys who wrote, wrote across the world. I want to find a story of his, a story about him that shows you the whole newspaper in, in context. And it allows you, what we've done here is we've taken 
every paper from 1851 to the end of 1980, and we put it online. Now, Evan's going to kill me because I, I ruined his demo, but <laughs> Evan Sandhouse is a brilliant developer who, who created Time Machines in the audience. But if you really want to look at Time Machine, it's a great way to sort of search any sort of you know, month or year of the paper. Let's sort of look at and see if we can find something from, say, 38 years ago or 40 years ago. We can go and we get this piece of history. So we have a rich trove of metadata. We have generations of, of taxonomists and library scientists who've been cataloging the New York Times. We can put that in. Um, Zoom in, you can look at a particular article, you can read the metadata about it, and then you can, you can browse. I can spend sort of hours looking at Times Machine. I can also sort of look at the ads, which from previous generations, it's sort of like an old episode of Mad Men. It's, just, it's an amazing thing. Uh, so uh, that's Times Machine. It is a, um, it is, it is a subscription product. You have to get it as part of your New York Times subscription. However, tomorrow, Times Machine is free for everyone for 24 hours as part of a uh, promotion we're doing. So I urge you to, to look into it, look, look back on it, uh, and, and try and find it. So you can Google yourself on Google, of course, but you can also, if you the New York Times ever, you can look for yourself in Times Machine and find yourself there. So that's Times Machine. So thank you. Sustainable formats uh, that we can for 
legacy media and also for new media. So that involves, as I said, you know, involves conversion, but it also involves uh, looking at uh, examples uh, and workflows that are happening now and trying to find out where are the sources of uh, risk within the new productions. So we were very collaborative, and I would say that um, in terms of research, not only um, as faculty, but also the students themselves. Um, so one of the first initiatives that we worked on was uh, with the National Digital Information Infrastructure Program at the Library of Congress on preserving digital public television. And uh, with PBS, with WGBH, and with um, WNT, and right now we're working to um, on a proposal with the Digital Library at NYU to uh, to ex extend the capabilities of Archive It, which is a web archiving tool, to uh, look at this how that tool can start to ca capture video and what the issues around that might be in terms of bringing it into a repository and making it um, accessible again. So I know that we worked, uh, we had a graduate student who worked with Dirk at Broadway Video, um, doing some work on a project looking at workflow traffic, uh, source videos from traffic, um, a traffic study. So how did the workflow, how, is it, how can efficiencies be done? He also did an analysis of all kinds of different digital cameras and what kinds of output they, they do. So we're, we're doing a lot of work. And, Working also with musicians like Sonic Youth or David Byrne, um, and our students are all over. They're the Smithsonian working in, the, you know, digital asset management videos, and they're at the Library of Congress mapping metadata from the American Archive, um, tens of thousands of videos that are being transferred from public television stations and coming into the Library of Congress. So how do we take that metadata and move it into this new environment? and be able to maintain all of the richness of that, um, that metadata. Our students do a lot of internships, um, and in those they're often engaged in um, research as well. They do three internships in the course of the, the, um, the two-year program. So, um, you know, one day they might be running scripts um, on a batch of uh, video preservation masters and the, and the um, Preservation lab using FFmpeg and you know um, making a bunch of derivatives and bagging them and putting them onto the NAS or then the next in the same class in fact the next minute they might be trying to get that pneumatic to run through the transport you know when it's got sticky shed and everything is gumming up the machine is gumming up and trying to get that to move so I think I'm here. Um, you know, a lot has changed since we started the program. We used to go to Digital Beta Camp when we first, you know, doing preservation when I first came 10 years ago. Uh, I think that audio preservation in terms of files was just starting. And now, of course, everything we're, we're doing at Destin, all our destinations are digital. But in some ways, I don't, you know, a lot has changed, and in some ways, I don't think much has changed. And so I guess I'm the person here on the panel who is here to say that there are still a lot of boxes that need to be opened, and when you open those boxes, you still need to know, is this a negative? Is this the optical track? Is this, uh, you know, what is this object that you're looking at? Is this something important? Is it something that's not so important? Is this a, you know, is it an air copy? Is it a, you know, master, or is it a rough edit, or is it a time-coded work tape, you know, from a, from a television production? So. So really, I think that's a wonderful thing about our program is we're both um, in those boxes every day and pulling that material out and fixing perforations, and, you know, as I say, getting takes to run through machines. But also our students are all organizing hackathons. We're bringing together programmers and um, archivists to solve problems like they did last year at the Association of Moving Association of Moving Image Archivists, which is a professional conference. So I, I guess I'm, I'll be talking a bit about more about the stuff in the boxes, and so looking forward to value in the vault, but sometimes it's not truly accessible yet. I'm uh, Owen Randall. I'm a researcher at Columbia University with the uh, Institute for Data Science and Engineering there. 
and I'm co-chair of the New Media uh, Center, it's called. And I do research in natural language processing, so my presentation will concentrate on text as opposed to multimedia. Um, so uh, how can we get at how can we get that information in text? How can we browse and access uh, a large trove of text? Uh, we can use the words, of course, and I call it scratching the foot surface because we just use the words as they occur in the text, perhaps for some minimal processing. And we all know that works extremely well. That's what Google does. We can then use the words to do something more fancy, such as topic modeling. Um, one approach is to use predefined topics. This would, for example, consist in taking a, a newspaper article and then automatically categorizing it into one of the sections of the New York Times. A different approach to topic modeling is when we don't assume pre-existing topics, but we have a large trove of texts and we want to figure out what's, what are the topics that are relevant for these texts. Um, this is uh, unsupervised topic modeling uh, pioneered by David Bly, who will join Columbia in the fall. Um, what is nice, of course, is that we don't have to have predefined topics, but the resulting topics are sometimes very hard to interpret. In contrast to the scratching the surface approach, I would like to propose a second approach, which is complementary, diving deep in, which is a mean based search and access and browsing. Now, when people say that they can uh, pull out the meaning of natural language text, be extremely wary. It is the holy grail of my field of study of natural language processing. And at this present moment, we have no general, versatile, broadly accepted representation of meaning that we could use. Uh, for this purpose, and because there isn't even uh, a meaning that we can use, there certainly is no software that goes from text to meaning. So what I would like to present in this very short uh, presentation here is a proposal to identify very, very specific meanings, so to go deep and narrow at the same time. And what I propose is what we call social interaction network extraction. This work uh, done by my student, Dukhurf Agarbal, who would not be here, but he's in India for doing his visa right now. Uh, what we're interested in is what we call social events. Um, there are three cases. Either two people are interacting, such as John and Mary at dinner, or we're all attending an event such as this, they're all interacting. Uh, the second case is one person is observing another. John saw Mary across the room. Mary's not aware of this happening. And the third case is there's no interaction at all. So this can often be the case when two people are mentioned in the same sentence. I know both John and Mary. This does not imply that they have ever interacted or know each other or anything. And our claim is that social networks are the results of many, many social events that get added up into social networks. And I should just point out that uh, when I use the word social network here, I don't mean Facebook and so on. That's the other meaning of social network. I mean the actual thing that, uh, that binds us together as human beings. And um, why we are suggesting that this social interaction network is useful is that we are at heart social animals, and of course our close relatives, uh, the apes and so on, are also social animals, um, but we, in contrast to the apes, have language. And what we like to do with that language is we love to talk about other people and their social events. This is gossip. So, in fact, there is lots and lots of information about social events in text. I'm going to give you three uh, very quick examples of what we've done. Uh, with this um, uh, research and the software package that we have. One is Alice in Wonderland, which is, of course, the 19th century novel. Uh, this is the resulting social network. The colors indicate the result of block modeling, which is a standard social network analysis tool to group together those nodes in a network that uh, have similar function in the network. What do we see? We see that Alice, of course, is at the center, no big surprise. But we also see on the left there the duchess, the cat, and the cook. Um, are grouped together in the, same, uh, in the same group. And over here, the two, the five, and the seven. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, not coincidentally, these groups that we identify in the social network correspond to the well-known pictures uh, by Daniel in, in the novel because they correspond to social events. And that's what you do. The second example are the diplomatic cables. This is a project uh, headed by Matthew Connolly, who's a professor of history at Columbia. And um, he is interested in looking at the diplomatic cables, which are the types of things that became famous or infamous through the WikiLeaks episode. 
Um, Matt is only looking at those that have been officially de declassified, which takes us up to 82. And this is a social network resulting from looking at the cables, I think it's out of Madrid in 1975 for a, a fairly small time period. But there are many, many, many of these cables, most of which have absolutely no interest to historians, so it will be impossible for a historian to actually read all of them. Um, the historians need some sort of tool to figure out what's important here. And this particular example, we see one of the most connected nodes is, of course, in Kissinger. And my third example is um, uh, Afghan newspaper stories about the Taliban. These are newspaper stories written in Pashto and translated into English. And our software currently only runs on English. Um, and we then ran it and extracted this network. Uh, and this is a project uh, spearheaded by Anand Kopal, who's a sociology, uh, who's doing his PhD in sociology at Columbia. Uh, and I want to highlight actually what's an outlier. I mean, those four nodes there are five nodes that are connected, and they're labeled both Fox, Mayor, Rogers, and Stephen. Somewhat surprising for an Afghan news story about the Taliban. It turns out that this particular newspaper had a serialized novel which was set in an Anglophone country, perhaps even translated from English into Pashto, we translated back into English, and extracted the social network of the novel embedded in the newspaper. But all the other results are actually meaningful relations between uh, people, Afghans, mentioned in the stories. To conclude, let me summarize here. Um, so I think uh, while doing word-based analysis is extremely useful, we can complement that as going deep and narrow and getting certain deep meanings and huge amounts of text so that we can have better access to browse for browsing um, and summarizing interpretation. Of course, we need to determine what means these are, and uh, we're proposing that social interaction networks is a good place to start, but there may be many other meanings that uh, can be developed in a similar manner. Um, and I have only talked about text, so I just want to mention in concluding here that there's also a nice potential for going multimodal here because the kind of meanings that um, are useful to be extracted from text, such as social interaction, can also be detected in images or video. This is, a, this is not my area of expertise. I believe this is cutting edge research right now in those areas, but it, it, it is possible now or will be possible in the next few years to identify whether a video shows two people interacting or one people observing someone else and to also label those. How many of you know MLB Advanced Media as a company? A part of what is well. Just a few, you're in for two. Thanks, Justin. Thank Jim for uh, hosting this here as well. Um, I did, uh, we're one of the newest members, I think, of uh, MSC Media Lab, and we wanted to uh, um, take a little time to introduce ourselves, I guess, since I'm not, not a lot of people are familiar with uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about that and then sort of dive into our archive um, um, work. Uh, first of all, we're, we're NYC born and bred a tech company. We were established in 2000. We're a wholly owned subsidiary of MLB and the 30 clubs themselves. We were uh, formed really as a repository for rights for the web, mobile, and interactive rights. And that's an important thing. I don't think that kind of consortium would happen today. Um, we're the eighth highest value privately held tech company, according to the Business Center. Um, we have 700 plus employees, with about 60% being technical or operations. Uh, it's very important to us that we develop our own technology. Baseball's a little bit different from our other um, sister sports in that um, it's, it's a game of tonnage. We do 2,500 games compared to other people who maybe play 13 Sundays in a row, for instance. Um, because of that, we had to deal with scale, volume, concurrency, and the tools just weren't out there. So we made the conscious choice to develop them uh, ourselves and to hire the individuals to do that ourselves. Because we built this scaled out system where we can handle live events concurrently, um, that's actually um, attracted a lot of third parties and that's our fastest growing division. Um, we are a business that's really focused on live. Um, we're a little bit at the other end of the parade from the archive business. Um, we're out front, uh, but our, and our product, the sports product for baseball, um, the value falls off precipitously after about three days. Uh, we do have a strong business. We do have a business on iTunes, uh, selling classic games. We have over a thousand titles there. Um, and it's, it's a good business for us, but that's really not where we're focused. Uh, live events are what we really have, have, have done our big work. Um, 
These are just some of our partners, um, March Madness uh, uh, for Turner. Uh, ESPN is probably our largest uh, uh, partner. We do 25,000 live events, as I mentioned, because of that. Two uh, per par partners who aren't mentioned here, brand new. One is Worldwide Wrestling. We'll talk a little bit about them later. And there's another new product that we're, we're doing with Sony, uh, which is a, a television distribution project. We'll hear about more in the fall. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit of how we're spread out across the country. As I mentioned, we started here in New York in 2000. Um, our main offices are down in Chelsea Markets. That's where our media and our uh, um, uh, data center is, as well as our transmission operations center. Um, we now have a second media center across the street in Level 3. We have a legacy data center in Chicago. Our newest um, facilities are in Omaha. That's uh, our main web facilities as well as our media backup, it's redundant to what we have here in New York City. Uh, we also have a transmission operations center that's opening in San Francisco, that is opening uh, in San Francisco. Um, this is an example of our uh, technical operations center in New York, where we basically, you can see we're pulling the regular feeds, all live video, um, all managed uh, and, and all uh, published from our infrastructure. I don't want to go deep into the architecture here. Um, the blue lines sort of represent video coming in, and the green lines sort of represent streaming video going out. I think the more interesting story for this uh, group of people really is around our uh, digital asset management system, which we built ourselves, provisioning and the types of metadata that we capture and that we surface and the way that we use those to help people discover what they're looking for. Um, provisioning is, that's a word we use for marshaling resources around a live event, basically assigning the coders, creating the actual links that are to be syndicated, DAM, digital asset management, trafficking, scheduling. Uh, the types of metadata that we add for baseball in particular is um, pitch effects, which is pitch information. We use that graphically in a lot of our products. This year we're adding player tracking information. In addition to pitch tracking, we're actually following the nine defenders, four runners, and various uh, coaches and players uh, uh, on the field. The stringer is the canonical source of data, as you know, baseball is very stats driven. Um, that they're at the ballpark. Their goal is to make things accurate, not fast. But the interesting thing that we wanted to talk about was the logger. The logger is the person who we have actually watching the entire game, and they are logging in real time. Our asset is logged as we look at it. They're also marking where commercial boundaries are, and they're marking highlights. Those highlights can be cut out of a real game and pushed out to all six major carriers and to the internet in about 30 seconds. So this is a live process. It's very streamlined for us because everything flows out of this live um, console into the archive flow, um, and we're focusing on operational speed and scale. I hope you can see this. This is an example of a logging console for baseball. It's sort of purpose-built. On the left-hand side is sort of a button-driven interface that auto-populates the baseball with the rosters that come in. All the buttons are specific baseball terms, but we also have um, uh, play commercials, another button that can be done there. We also have a note field so that if something special happens, um, we can also sort of value things. This, this uh, interface is um, completely scalable. We can adjust this to some of our other partner businesses like ESPN. We actually uh, skim this for, re this for wrestling as well. They came in with 30 years, 60,000 hours, 30 years of wrestling that really had very poor metadata. They had an idea of, of what their schema would be in order to surface meaning. They understood that the hierarchy of search would be first around wrestling, help them, and then venue, and then oddly enough, weapon, which is the steel chair. And fourth would be move, the like pile drive. And so we help them basically set up a console like this and allow their loggers to look at things even super real time and allow them to key in metadata. Uh, one thing about temporal data that I think is applicable to all archives is that the granularity that they go into the archive is at the granularity of the program. But the way they normally come out is really the granularity of the clip or the segment. One of the things that this uh, workflow provides is what we call milestones, so that we are temporarily putting keywords at points in the video. So when you search, we actually present the entire asset back to the viewer, but they're going to the point that they care about based on what the metadata is. We spent a great deal of effort slaving all of our videos, which carry time code, 
to be data that is also slated for the time code. So that when you, if you watch our product, we have a DVR on, on our baseball games. If you stop it, the data stops. If you scroll back, the data scrolls back. And that's a very valuable tool for us that um, a lot of other folks, are, uh, our partners are interested in as well. I'm just going to end up with just sort of a big sort of tonnage and scale slide. This is our distributive potty. Uh, this is our distribution package. It's not 4.6 megs, it's 14.6 megs. It's about a 15 meg stack. This is an HLS product. You make about 30 uh, gigs a game. As I mentioned, we have 2,500 games, but there's a home production and an away production. So that makes for 5,000 feeds. It's about 150 terabytes of distribution copy. But then, of course, we make an archive of all of those masters, and those are much higher bit rate. Those are DD100 products, so they're eight times the size. That brings us to about three quarters of a petabyte. We have in highlights, we have 150 terabytes per season, and we have about 1.5 petabytes per season that we generate. So this is why the importance of the live metadata creation at the front is so important. Um, so we can actually find where everything is. Um, we, that really ends up with, we have 15 petabyte robots, large tape robots, one Southern Manhattan, one a mirror image in Omaha. These are the big storage tech room size robots. Um, 1,500 servers for delivering things. We have a very large land backbone so that we can move video across the country easily. And each of our data uh, centers are concerned about 12 gigs concurrently. It's a lot of video to be pushed out. And so I'll leave it on that, just on the big tonnage slide. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we're going to pass that mic uh, for each of you to speak. But I, I'm going to start with just a couple of questions and then I'm going to let you all ask some, some questions. Uh, so do prepare those. Um, I, I want to start by asking a question of the, uh, of the corporate participants, particularly Mark and Dirk, but also Jim, um, in the sense that, uh, you know, for a lot of media companies, the imperative is always to create new stuff. So you're, you know, baseball. Uh, it's new stuff coming every day, the perishability of the, the three-day cycle you're talking about. Mark, it's the news, you know, uh, an old copy of the New York Times, a week old, you know, I might just toss it out. But, um, you know, is this, is this stuff, this archival content, is the ability to surface it, use it in new ways, um, is, it, is it really changing your business in any way, or will it change your business? Uh, I think it will change our business. As we think about news and as you think about the movement to have greater context for news events, and the archive becomes really important, especially in our archives. So uh, the other day, Arthur Gell, uh, who was a you know, legendary sort of managing editor of the Times, passed away and had an obituary of him. Now, he, he was someone who was a major cultural figure. He discovered, you know, was one of the people who discovered Woody Allen, Bruce, Barbara Streisand, and in our archive were all these old articles that he'd written. And so when we did his obituary on, on the web, we were able to use Time Machine to you know, link to and show those articles in context. So that enriched his, his obituary, certainly, and was a, a great usage for us. And for our business, so much of what we do is based around engagement. We really want to, you know, we live in such an ADD world that everybody's flitting from one Twitter feed to the to the next and one hour to the next. And so our model is really based on exposing people to our quality content, past and present, and we would meld that together to, to make something unique. So it's about context, yeah. I wanted to sort of, a, a little bit away from video, one of the things that we're finding is this new historical data that for player tracking, that we're developing pitch tracking ultimately, is that we, we can show intra-game data, how metrics of how fast somebody ran, what their top speed was, what their cornering efficiency was. But we're actually looking forward to the day where we have years and years of that information or being able to go back to the historical record and to begin to compare people historically to uh, previous years of play to themselves or to other players. And I think there's interesting ways we can do that. We've even been looking at ways that we could take old clips and combine them and overlay, statistically show the difference there, but also maybe visually represent that as well. But maybe an idea for using old stats in, a, in the new life. And, and Jim, your, your business is a bit different. I mean, obviously, you're <coughs> monetizing archive content every day. I mean, what's next for Shutterstock? What are the, the methodologies, the technologies you're investing in? Yeah, obviously, uh, let me just make a point around uh, the earlier point, which is uh, the images that we collect in our library and, uh, and, and, and 
trends of freshness and looking at uh, uh, whether or not archival content, which is content that's more older, uh, whether or not that still have relevance. And we're finding that uh, in many cases, uh, even content that's from 10 years ago still are favorably received by many of our customers, primarily because um, we look at data. Uh, we have a lot of behavior there. We also have a lot of customers around the world. So what we're finding is that the uniqueness of the customer uh, base is able to, uh, to discover the uniqueness of an image or a video, even though it may be many years old, which is a fascinating part for us. Uh, in terms of the, the um, you know, what's next for us, you know, we certainly have a, a lot of interest to continue to expand. We just recently launched a music site. Uh, we're adding uh, audio music to uh, our ability to, uh, uh, to service our customers, so we're very excited about that. Uh, and obviously the technology aspect of it is, uh, is different. Uh, searching for music is a lot different than searching for images or video. So those are the, the exciting part of our, our future. And Mel, Mel and Owen, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, but from your perspective in institutions of higher education, you work with the media, you send students into, into these types of organizations as employees later on. What are the media companies, maybe not those in this panel, but what are media companies not doing that they should be doing?
computer science people do work on this. I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. We're we're a big data business company, and those are the skills that we're looking for. Uh, like your, we're hiring. Um, anyone wants to come see me afterward? But yeah, uh, we're hiring a full range of skills. So uh, data science is is certainly a big one for us. We're representing our data science and machine learning team. Uh, we're really looking. For, for great iOS and Android developers, great JavaScript developers, but with respect to the archive and archival material itself, it really pays to have a passion for, for the subject. I mean, Times Machine, there was a first version of Times Machine, which predates this one, which was a labor of love of, of a single developer. In the early days of cloud computing, you use the cloud. This version of Times Machine, I would, I would say this was a, a labor of love for Evan Sandhouse and his team really brought that thing to life. It was not something that was, believe it or not, a, a core kind of priority for the organization. It was just sort of one of many, but it was something that, that we did and is, is extremely successful. So, so developers who really want to be creative and, and take some chances and have new ways of combining content, those, those are always people who are looking for. Uh, I would just echo the same. Um, the, the only ad I would uh, include is uh, we're looking for technologies that has a sense of disruption. So in a way, not to think about what's in the past, but what could be in the future, and uh, and, and not be afraid to fail and, uh, and bring forth the technology that we're, we're interested in. So that's the only angle I think we're a little bit uh, more focused there. So I'm going to take some questions from the audience. We got a question? And uh, if I'll just ask, as, you, as you reply, I may put your question to an individual if you don't mind uh, to start. And the panel is welcome to take the question. But if the individual would just repeat, because we don't have a mic in the audience. Question here. Oh, 
Well, some of us have a question. I'll go over there. Yes. So, yes, so all of our uh, images in our collection is all commercial. And uh, what that means is, uh, unlike the free images that's on the internet, these are all pre-licensed. So we have really made all the, the challenging work of agreeing with those contributors that give us their precious images uh, and the terms associated with that. Uh, and on the other hand, we also have uh, various licensing models, such as standard licensing versus enhanced license, which stipulates how they could be used uh, and how they should be used. Uh, and uh, so these are all uh, things that we have already done in terms of the, the heavy duty lifting uh, to make sure every one of our images uh, are well in compliance or, or well regulated from that standpoint. Um, and we do find that sometimes that uh, um, our customers do not follow the rules to some extent, similar to many other uh, content providers. Uh, and when those situations are, arise, we, we do work with our customers to, to look for resolutions. I've got time for one last question. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is for Mark and Dirk. We've talked a lot about being able to monetize archival data. And Dirk, you showed a slide of what has 15 petabytes of archival data in storage. What efforts is your team putting forth to decreasing the cost to manage that storage infrastructure or, or being able to utilize new technologies like the cloud to, to reduce the cost per archival data? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, the cost per bit of tape, we have higher and higher density tapes every year. We've gone up, we're now T10K, five terabytes, and I think we're moving to the new 15 terabytes. So we're reducing a lot of those lines. I don't think we would ever, now that we've made this investment, I doubt we would ever go to the cloud for any reason. No, we, we haven't that built, although that's a very appealing uh, aspect for other individuals. And in some ways, we're turning it around, and we, many of our partners, are happy with the fact that we have the infrastructure and we have a dam in front of it. And so we're learning ways of actually sharing that, condomizing it uh, to help to bifurcate that, the, 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 uh, the dam and allow them to, to share part of it. So that's another way that you can uh, mitigate the cost. Anybody else in reduction of cost? So uh, time machine is larger on the cloud. Uh, we don't have petabytes of, of, of data for that, although there are certainly terabytes. However, um, you know, the Times recently uh, started to do a major push on video. Now it's going to take some time, but we're archiving all of that video information. So that is not on the cloud. And we're always looking for ways to, to, save, to save money in terms of storage and, and bandwidth and, and computational power. So it's something we're always, we're always on the lookout for. And we think the cost of storage, as it has been, will continue to, to decline over time. And, and we'll take it back. Okay, I think we're going to call it close. We've run out of time. I know that there are uh, two faculty members here who have said they're looking for corporate partnerships, potentially, uh, and three uh, 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 corporate technologists who said they're hiring. I think there's also a bit more beer left, uh, so that means that maybe there's some conversations to be had in the audience. I want to thank Jim uh, and Shutterstock for hosting us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia, Lee, Lab. Thank you again. Thank you all for coming. Did we learn something about uh, the the arc and the archives? Yeah. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and please visit NYC Media Lab before you come to the next one. All right. Thanks so much.